As Chris said, today is World Day of Immunology, and tonight it's my very great honour to introduce Professor Rolf Zinknagel, who is currently Professor Emeritus in Experimental Immunology at the University of Zurich. Born and raised in Basel and graduating with an MD from medical school at the university there, his initial interests lay in becoming a surgeon. This he did for a year or so before deciding that he would prefer to focus his efforts into the study of immunology. He moved first to Zurich and then to Assam to study in this area before travelling to Australia in 1973 to become a PhD student and later a postdoctoral researcher at the John Curtin School of Medical Research. Here, here he and his colleague Peter Doherty made seminal observations on how cytotoxic T cells recognised virus infected cells in an infected host. It was for this work that they were recognised by the award of the Nobel Prize in 1996. He left Australia for the United States in 1975, but returned to the University of Zurich in 1980. Since 1992, Professor Zenkabel has been working in the Institute of Experimental Immunology at the University of Zurich, studying the role of antigen-dependent beneficial immune protection in detrimental immunopathology, I'll get all that in a minute, <laughs> and comparing these mechanisms with theories of immunological memory and immunological tolerance. He officially retired from the university in 2008, but holds emeritus status there. In addition to the Nobel Prize, Professor Dean Mabel has also been awarded the Old Glasgow Medical Research Award in 1995 and the Cancer Research Institute William B. Colby Award in 1987. In 1999, he was awarded an honorary companion of the Order of Australia, Australia's highest civilian honour for his scientific work with, with Professor Doherty. Professor Zinkenable joins us tonight to share some of his expertise in the area of immunological memory and tolerance, vaccine failings, and potential strategies for increased vaccine efficiencies and his vision for the future of this field. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Rolf Zinkenable as he presents his lecture on vaccines against infection. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here and I thank you very much indeed for your kind in invitation and your introduction. Now, 40 years ago, just about 40 years ago, I moved here with my family, wife and two kids, from Switzerland and landed in, I'd say, excellent conditions at the ANU. You know, we were immediately arriving housed into a detached so-called Hughes ghetto half house and uh, next morning I went to work so I think uh, this uh, was extremely attractive for a young family such as ours and then of course we were extremely lucky and found something important which you know you cannot really plan for it just happened and really very good also is that Peter and I get along still very well, you know. <laughs> and enjoy not only the frustration of, of research, but also the rare occasions of glory. And that I'm able to talk to you about vaccines against infections um, is a privilege and an honour. So what I'd like to do is give us a rather biased point of view, namely mine, and Peter wouldn't agree at all with my overall interpretation, but give you some ideas why some of the vaccines we have, actually all the vaccines we have, protect us via so-called antibodies soluble molecules that are in blood or serum. And we do not have a single vaccine that protects us via so-called cell-mediated, cell-dependent, directly cell-dependent 
protective immune mechanisms. And it actually was in 1973-74 on this particular part of the immune system, the cell mediated, that Peter and I got some, some laurels. And I'd like to start to do so by giving you a feeling for where immune defense mechanisms are very good. And if you look at the immune system, for example, the targets against which viruses or bacteria, very important, or parasites, but also tumors, we would like to have the immune response do something about. You know, there is a hope to have vaccines against tumors, solid peripheral tumors. Leukemias, from an immunological point of view, is easy because these leukemia, their blood, born tumor cells, they circulate and therefore they are easily accessible. But the solid tumor in your kidney or in your big toe, that's about as far uh, away you can get from lymph nodes and spleen, the, the organized lymphatic uh, system, uh, is quite another issue. And there, to find a good surgeon, you know, is, is, is the first rule. But what I wanted to show here is that with all these problems, there is an area where the immune system is very efficient, but there are other, you know, co-evolutionary that situations that have developed over extremely long periods of time, where the immune defense is actually very inefficient if, if, if there at all. And I will try to give you a feeling for this balance. For example, with viruses, this is particularly easy to, to illustrate. Now, the conclusions of today's lecture are summarized here. Protective vaccines all protect via antibodies. And this can be easily correlated with the fact that all vaccines that work simply imitate co co evolution. That's where the immune system is best, best. We cannot do better than evolution if we use the same tools as evolution. So where evolution has sort of you know, accepted antibodies as being the balancing effic efficacious defense mechanism, there we can do vaccines very efficiently. But for all the other ones, um, namely all the infectious agents, where the target, the immunological target on the surface, on the envelope of the bacteria or the viruses or the parasites, changes all the time under the pressure of the immune system, there we haven't really been able to make vaccines. And I'll explain that to you. And of course, at the end of the day, my message is rather depressing because the only way to really be efficient against these types of problems is actually to change our human behavior. And as you all know, that's, this is the most complicated and most, most difficult thing to do, at least for me. And vaccines against solid tumors or chronic persistent infections are, and this is again a sort of a, a common theme throughout all of biology. You know, things are never completely impossible, but they are highly unlikely. And of course, by arguing it's not impossible, you can raise a lot of hope. But that's not good enough, because at the end of the day, you have to bring the goodies and the goods and do something about it. So let's try and develop that and just look at where vaccines are available and which ones are not. And this list is, of course, not complete. But it's very straightforward. Poliomyelitis, 
bacterial toxins, measles, haemophilus influenza, you know, many acute infectious agents that basically kill us in seven days, we have excellent vaccines. And of course, antibodies are instrumental in controlling or even eliminating these infections. And these antibody responses have to be extremely prompt, otherwise we would be dead and not sitting here for sure. Now, those not available would include tuberculosis, leprosy, or HIV, or malaria, many other things. And the common theme of all of these versus all of these is that these are non-mutating, basically. They have stable surface structures on the envelope of the virus, the bacterium, whatever it may be. These all vary. Or they have some very special host infectious agent, you know, relationships that make it very difficult to get rid of such infections. For example, for TB or leprosy, it's called a granuloma at the site of infection, for example, classically in the lung. And that granuloma is a bit like a encapsulation of the infectious area. So the immune response actually cannot get into this area very efficiently. And from that point of view, you can compare such a chronic TB or leprosy lesion to a tumour, because a tumour has a very similar quality. It's basically something that is wrong, that is in the peripheral solid or, you know, lung tissue, that is very difficult to not only reach, but also to penetrate by a ongoing immune response. So you will see some commonalities in many of these problems that we really haven't been able to, to solve. And the, the common solution to these problems is always protective or neutralizing antibodies. In this case, you need antibodies, but in addition, you need so-called activated cell-mediated immunity. And no vaccine so far has been able to imitate these chronic infections. And of course, the key factor is these viruses you want to kick out, or the bacterial infection or the toxins. You want to get, get rid of it, otherwise you die. Here, it doesn't really matter whether you get rid of it. You just have to prevent that the infection spreads too widely. And is it, of course, the persisting infection that keeps the immune response going all the time? But at the same time, you can't get rid of the infection. So it's sort of a, a balance that doesn't kill you too quickly, as in this case. This takes seven to 10 days. This only kills you, let's say, in 20 years or 30 years. But by that time, you have done your biology. Namely, you have had your kids with, let's say, 13 or 15. You have, you know, raised them for another eight years or so. And then you, we all can go because we have done our biology. So that may not be acceptable to all of you, but that's just how it is. Now, let's summarize in very simple terms what immunity, that is, the resistance against infection by the immune system, basically is about. There's so called innate, natural, general resistance um, that is responsible for more than 95% of you know, defense mechanisms. Interferon is a classical factor of that system. And it is non-specific, that is, it basically acts against most of the viruses or most of the bacteria and so on. But then there are specific aspects. And one interesting observation is that, for example, in chicken eggs, but also reptile eggs, there is always a huge depot of chicken mother antibodies that is handed down in these into these chicken eggs, which already gives us sort of 
a hint at the importance of the mother's immune immunity and having survived all relevant infections to actually hand down her immunological experience in form of a secretable immune defense, namely antibodies, to the offspring. And we'll get back, back to that as well. And all, as I've said, all the anti protective um, vaccines are inducing antibody. We have no vaccine. And th there's an additional point that sort of fits with these antibodies in eggs. And that is that so-called autoimmune diseases, that is, diseases caused in by, let's call it, this balanced function of the immune system, where actually the immune response is not against a foreign invader, such a virus or a bacterium, but actually is addressed against the host's own antigens. And there are a number of so-called autoimmunities or immunopathologies, diseases caused by faulty immune responses. And there's a, an important group where autoimmune antibodies play a major role. Lupus is, for example, one, arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, but there's also certain diseases of particularly endocrine organs, like diabetes, juvenile diabetes, or, or certain inflammations of the thyroid gland. The interesting part here is that the chance of females of having such a antibody-dependent autoimmune disease is about 5 to 1 compared to males. And that probably fits with the fact that mothers have to transfer their antibody response in form of the product to the offspring, whereas males cannot do so yet. Maybe another 50 years, you know, <laughs> this will all come, up, come about. So, there's a last very general point I'd like to make, and that is that, again, you see that these autoimmune diseases, but also tumours, against which immune responses in general terms are very inefficient if have any impact at all, these are all diseases that come up basically after 25. And I've given you already before the reason why that is. Because the species has to survive 25 years, otherwise we wouldn't sit here. So, if we now go to the specifics, here is a virus as a prototypic virus, and it shows the very important characteristic of having the same determinant on the surface in a highly repetitive fashion. And this is true for all infectious agents. There's not a, almost, there's no exception. And this pattern here makes that actually only one determinant is visible to the immune system on the intact particle. Because the structures are a bit comparable to my fingers, and when you see the dimensions, the length versus the diameter of the finger, you can easily imagine if the antibody is about this size, there is no space for the antibody to actually go in between. So the only accessible point on an intact virus, but the same is basically true to bacteria and, and classical parasites, is there's only one weak spot sort of visible or recognisable on the intact infectious agents. And this defines, that site defines what we call serotype. You probably may remember that poliovirus has three, there are three types of poliovirus, namely one, two, and three. If you are immune against the type one polio, you are not protected against two or three. And that's why the vaccine, the classical vaccine, contains these three types of agents. 
But that means, because most of the rest of the poliovirus is the same, except for the tips of these surface structures, means that that surface structures, the tip of my finger equivalent on the virus, is the key determinant that determines whether you are immune or not. Now, the second point I'd want to make here is that for most types of infectious agents, and I exaggerate slightly, there are basically two outcomes. Some viruses infect a cell and then destroy the cell. And the cell decays and the offspring of that virus factory get released, go into the blood, spread throughout the body and will infect many cells. And because that virus is so-called cytopathic, that is, destroys a bit the host cell, it causes damage, and that kills the host. And this usually happens within, you know, five to seven, ten days. And therefore, the immune response has to be very prompt and extremely rapid. Within two, five days, the response has to be up, otherwise, you know, in that race, things can't be caught up with. And the antibodies, these Y type of molecules that have two binding sites, identical binding sites, sort of, you know, cover up that virus by binding to these surface determinants, and that prevents this released virus, due to the blockage by these antibodies, to infect the next cell. And that's obviously very efficient. Now, T cells also play some role, these cell-mediated defense mechanisms, but they are not really key for these cytopathic viruses because the, 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 the yes, essence is really to prevent hematogenic blood spread of these viruses. And the reason is very simple. If the virus gets to your brain, and since we only have one brain, that's the end of it. Whereas for, you know, skin, of course, you know, skin, you make blisters and all sorts of liver lesions, but things are not as acute as if the neural system is hit. And this antibody can prevent extremely efficiently. Now, for these types of viruses, of course, the problem is different. Because the virus does not cause the damage of the replicating host cell, and therefore, basically, one can argue it doesn't matter whether you have an immune response or not, because the virus or the infection doesn't cause any harm. And it's interesting to note that these viruses here jump, as a rule, in the first few years of our life, and therefore we call them acute childhood types of infections, polio, measles, blah, blah, blah. Whereas these viruses jump either before birth or at birth from mother who carries the virus to the offspring. Why is that so? Because you see, these T cells can recognize the infection on this host cell. But the T cells, part of that cell-mediated immune system, cannot distinguish whether this is a virus that kills a host cell like this or doesn't kill the host cell. So this cell-mediated immune defense goes off like a rocket and would destroy this host cell. So actually the immune response in that case sort of is more damaging than in a way protective. Because the virus wouldn't cause the damage, it's only the immune response against the virus. And several viruses belong to that group of infections, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV to a large extent would, would belong to. And that's why these viruses actually jump around birth, because at birth, our own human, also the mouse is the same, human in, in, immune system is immature. It doesn't react. And why doesn't it react? Because in the development, the system can only mature to also reject, so to say, the mother after birth, because otherwise you would have a premature type of birth. 
which, of course, because of the different difference between mother and offspring and father and mother and offspring, this is a serious problem. I'll get back to that. Now, this is the usual way of an infection, and you have experienced all that, or your kids. The infection usually starts at the skin or the mucosal surfaces. From there, the virus or the bacterium, you know, replicates locally, and then gets somehow into the draining lymph node. That's why, you know, you have hurting lymph nodes, for example, in measles infection or so. And there, a first um, immune reaction or response gets mounted. And this is very important because that's about two days, third day after infection, and there are only a few of these immune cells around, and this first confrontation actually amplifies and makes the number of these specific B cells and T cells rather large because every six hours these cells divide you know, from one to two, four, eight, and so on. And that sort of, then, if okay, stops the amplifying capacity of the virus or bacterium by the lymphocytes and the products released by the lymphocytes, like antibodies, sort of catch up in numbers. And then the virus or the bacteria or the toxin spreads via blood, and that's where everything has to be caught up with. And I've already explained the problem with um, particularly nervous tissue, but you can follow the type of standard infection, particularly with herpes viruses causing, you know, the, the blistery type of lip um, um, uh, lesion that after a few days, you know, gets controlled again, and herpes virus sort of hides away in some nervous tissue, and from there it comes periodically and then gets controlled again. By so that's a typical type of, of yin-yang, uh, ping-pong type of play between the immune system and, and the virus. And this is actually quite, quite common and, and, uh, and is, uh, can be applied to many infections. Now, infections, as I've said, particularly against those agents that kill you within seven to ten days, the rules of the game are as follows. The virus grows, you have a T cell or cell mediated immune defense, and you make tons of antibodies. And you can measure them in two ways, via protective neutralization, that is, it neutralizes or you know, prevents this virus caused cell damage, or by sticking some of the virus onto plastic plates and see whether the antibody bites. That's the usual diagnostics. But the second group of viruses that do not kill the cell, that don't kill you because the virus has jumped at birth and basically it doesn't cause damage and there's no immune response and therefore no immunologically mediated damage, the kinetics are different. The virus, you know, replicates. There are these plastic bound or binding antibodies, but they are not protective. But in addition, you have cell-mediated responses, like up here. But then these protective or neutralizing antibodies, they take 100 days, 300 days, or even more. And this is not just in this particular mouse virus. It certainly is found for hepatitis B virus infection in humans you know, cell-mediated responses, these plastic-binding ELISA responses, and neutralizing antibodies come up after 80 to 100 days. The same is true for HIV. Why is that? Because the antibody response against these determined, as I've characterized them, are extremely weak and take a long time to build up from very rare cells up to a efficient concentration. And this, of course, is a problem. Because by the time these antibodies have been made, the virus that should be controlled has already mutated away. Because of huge number 
the possibility of simply evading this immune response are very real. Now comes a problem. Immunology has textbooks, you know. We all learn textbooks first. And in the textbooks, it's like a Bible, you know. You know what is known and what you have to accept because otherwise you will not get good marks and pass the exams to become a doctor. Now, the problem with textbooks is, in general, that about half is right. And the other half is wrong. We don't quite know all the time which half is right. <laughs> so there's a big problem. Because in textbooks it says, and this is correct, this is experimentally done, you know, a thousand times, we have so-called immunological memory. And this sort of reminds you of our own memory. You know, and we don't know what our neurological memory is either. Some say it's a hardwired, you know, network type of connection that fixes the memory. And there are others who say, no, no, this is, cannot be. Um, it is a continuous recall of memorized memories. And dreaming during the night time is part of that constant recall. And you'll see we have a similar problem in immunology. Because immunologists, hardcore immunologists say, well, memory is easy to explain. You immunize a mouse or a human with antigen. You get a antibody response over time. That antibody response decays perhaps a bit, but when you then come back a second time, then the response gets boosted up enormously to very high titers and much more quickly as shown by this steeper curve. Now this is true. There's nothing wrong with that experiment. But what is wrong is that in all textbooks this phenomenon, you immunize, you come back, you recall your immunologic memory, it's quicker and higher, is equal to protection. And because of immunological memory, the argument goes, vaccines work. Because as you remember, you vaccinate kids three or four times, three months, six months, 12 months, 24 months, and this vaccine should keep them immune for the rest of their life. Now, this seems to work very well for this, but of course doesn't. And one of the reasons for, for not having this type of immune response, as I've said, is that these viruses, HIV or hepatitis B, vary all the time. So escape, even would escape a vaccine. And malaria basically does the same. It simply mutates, changes all the time. The surface determines. Now, you know, it, in science, you have, like in real life, you have to make choices. Now, and this is sort of a rather critical comment, if you want to demonstrate memory, that is, long duration of something you have immunized against, you choose a test that basically gives you a long-term positive result. And this is when you stick your vaccine antigen on plastic, because these responses are very long-term. But this is not what you're really interested in, because you're interested in protection. For that, you have to measure these protective or neutralizing antibodies, where you basically, in a tissue culture, you put virus in, you titrate, in various dilutions, your antibody or your serum or your blood, and you look where is the dilution of your blood that still prevents the virus of eating up your, your cells and make them all kaput. And there you see that actually the protection level is well defined, and this, you know, 
After immunization, this drops off very rapidly. After 30 to 40, 50 days, the protection is gone. So, if you want to publish and make papers on immunological memory, you use this method. <laughs> if you want to show that memory doesn't exist, you use the alternative. But of course, disease doesn't care about publication. Disease cares uh, about biology. So you do an alternative experiment. And this was done in the lab. You immunize with a vaccine, a mouse. And then you take these so-called memory cells, immune cells, and you adoptively you transfer them into a naive recipient that has never seen the infection or the vaccine. And then you challenge that host with the virus. That's basically, you know, what happens in childhood. And you see all the mice die. So whatever that memory comprises in these cellular elements doesn't protect. But if you take from that mouse the blood or the serum, this is all three months after or a year after having vaccinated, you transfer that serum to a naive recipient, you challenge, they all survive. So the key to protection is not these memory or these immunized cells or immune cells, B and T cells. It's actually the product of these cells, namely the antibodies that are released by certain immune cells. We call them B cells. Now, you know, if your first infection kills you as a child, you certainly don't need immunological memory, of course. <laughs> if you survive the first infection, the first exposure, you basically also don't need, even theoretically, Im Im immunological memory because the system has proven efficient against that infection. So, a second time it will be as efficient. With age, you know, after 60 or in my age, things become a bit more dicey because the efficiency of the system after all, was only constructed to last for about 25 years, you know, at 70 things sort of. <laughs> but this is also true for neurological memory, as you <laughs> probably remember. So, you know, earlier and better is not equal to protection. And memory doesn't really explain what protection is all about. So, the question is now, why, why, why do mothers transfer antibodies, as I've said initially? And because there the question comes immediately, why and how are mother and maternal antibodies kept high titered? Because only high enough titers hand it down to the Newborn, of course, will be protective. Now, there's fantastic um, biology summarized in this rather primitive slide. You look at humans and calves. In humans, the embryo of a fetus is separated from the mother via the placenta. And that membrane that separates the two is a single membrane, full membrane, that comes from the mother's side. From the mother's side, you have blood, and this membrane, built by the embryo, has receptors for antibodies. We call them FC receptors. And this membrane of the fetus hooks to these antibodies that come from the mother's blood and transports these antibodies through that membrane to the blood of the not yet born embryo or fetus. And then within the last trimester, the antibodies of the mother are all represented in the unborn child. 
And at birth, the child comes with all the immunological experience of the mother in the form of these antibodies. And it's these antibodies that protect the offspring. Because remember, the offspring cannot have an, a functioning immune system, otherwise there would be a confrontation with the differences against the mother. I'll get back to that. Now, the calves have even a more interesting and more radical solution. They have a fully doubly membraned separation between the offspring and the mother. And there is no antibody or tr protein transport mechanism that would allow to transport these maternal antibodies through both membranes. So the fetal calf actually has no antibodies because its own immune system has the same problem, must not make an immune response. So the fetal calf has no antibodies in cell. And that's why we biologists use fetal calf serum because the fetal calf serum has no antibodies that you know, disturb our experiments. But that's a practical little detail. But the calf is born without maternal antibodies. So it's exposed to infections as the humans after being dropped onto this earth and there's no immune mechanism against any infection except for the colostral milk, that is the first milk, which is basically a concentrate of antibodies, maternal antibodies, of the IgG, of the IgA type and so on. And these colostral antibodies actually are being drunk by the calf after birth, and now these same hooks for picking up the antibody from the mother are expressed in the gut of the calf of all ruminants. And they pick up these antibodies of the mother, they have drunk through the colostrum milk, and within the first 18 hours after birth, these functions, the antibodies are taken up and go directly to serum of the newborn calf. So within 18 hours, all the antibodies are there, and the calf is protected. If this is prevented from happening, the calves die of very trivial types of, of bacterial and viral infection. Now, this was experienced actually by farmers because they thought that dirty, you know, brownish first milk, this colostrum milk, actually should be thrown away. And they deprived by doing so the essential protective mechanism of maternal origin in these cases. So, now let's go back to the human situation. You have here mother AB genetically with father CD. Now the offspring will be half mother, half genes of the father, let's take AC. And because this offspring differs from the mother by C, this is like a foreign graft, like a foreign kidney, let's say. And that's why the mother must not reject this foreign graft, namely the fetus. So on the graft, on this fetus, they are basically, against the mother, there are no transplantation antigens expre expressed, and therefore it's like a neutral tumour. Hmm? On the other hand, the kid is AC and could react against mother's B parts. And as I've said, that's the reason why the offspring has no immune capacity. So now, a virus, let's call it X, infects the mother at the time of pregnancy. That's, of course, an unacceptable situation. Why? Because that virus may well kill the mother, but also may kill the fetus. If the mother is immune, of course, she has antibodies or T cells, cell mediated immunity, and therefore will not get sick when infected by that virus. But if the mother is immune, she will also have antibodies against virus X. And at birth, the offspring will have these anti X antibodies received by the process I've you know, summarized to you 
picking up through the placenta the EFC receptors going to the offspring and the offspring is born has anti-X antibodies and therefore if it encounters the infection X it will be protected via the maternal protection and this will of course under so-called wild type conditions that is before let's say 1940 you know under field conditions that before 1940 we all lived under field, field conditions we get exposed to these viruses all the time and therefore these infections will be attenuated via the maternal antibodies but since the maternal antibodies have a half-life and function basically with a half-life of 20 days eventually these maternal antibodies will go down and once they start to go down such infections will be still a bit attenuated but still they will actually infect the host and by that time the immune system has matured and now the offspring makes an immune response but you see it all centers around antibody it's antibody that protects and it's only the titer of antibody at birth that will decide whether the offspring survives or not and that's why that is the key correlate of protection the pre-existing antibody titer at the time of infection now there's a second example i've shown you where the offspring is also born with these anti-x antibodies but because living under you know canberian or new york type of conditions no exposure to any infection because mother looks very carefully after the kid there's no exposure no crash no nothing um, no playing in the park and therefore there is no exposure to x the maternal antibodies as i've said you know will dwindle after two years usually you don't find any maternal antibodies any longer now if the first exposure comes later at five or six or ten because kids were not exposed you have a problem because now these maternal antibodies don't attenuate that first infection and then you get all the problems like juvenile you know paralytic polio and that was a classical you know situation in the early 50s when hygiene measures were suddenly available to many people you know showering every day twice or three times and get rid of everything and the infections occurred then early june or early summer when the kids went first to the swimming pool why because this is a diarrhea virus so you know swimming pools are fantastic um, media to spread these types of infections and what was the usual reaction swimming pools were closed kids stayed at home until that thing was over so continuous exposure to infection is a key to all acute infections but if that sort of is prevented we have in a way a problem because we don't get that build up of the newborns or the kids own immune and that's where vaccination comes in so you basically imitate this situation with vaccines but now you have another problem because your maternal antibodies actually attenuate or weaken or even completely eliminate the efficacy of your vaccine because at three months your maternal antibodies are high you bring in the vaccine the vaccine is basically neutralized or destroyed and this now brings you up to you know a very practical aspect of medicine medicine basically is trial and error if it works it works if it doesn't work it doesn't work and with the vaccines pediatricians you know did exactly that they found out early vaccination doesn't work so before three months don't even start then you try it three months but 
just for safety, you do it three months, six months, 12 months, 24 months. And that is exactly spreading the odds of having too much or not enough maternal antibodies. So you hit it right somewhere. And it works. So fantastic. But it's really, you know, easy. To make an efficient vaccine, you simply follow what nature has experienced and found out a long time ago. And you simply do it similarly. But you can overdo it. And I've shown you that overdoing it in a way, in high hygienic measures, you know, has again new drawbacks. Or to come in back with vaccines has other drawbacks because you lose your immunization power. So, my conclusion is, of course, we have vaccines because it works, and we have only those vaccines where antibodies protect us. We don't have vaccines where, because the infectious agent, you know, changes all the time, we don't have this type of protection. Memory is a nice idea, but as we know with old age, even we, without memory, we still can survive halfway. And uh, I think uh, this is true also for immunological memory. Um, uh, memory is, uh, is basically wrong. It's a laboratory artifact, and it's nice for publishing paper. Um, protection depends on pre-existing the available antibody titer as the newborn baby shows. And uh, therefore, it's very important to immunize mothers, keep these antibodies high, even under conditions where hygiene prevents, for example, pertussis virus, you know, to boost the titer. And that's probably why pertussis is back. Actually, pertussis hasn't gone. Uh, and I've shown you that the variability of HIV, malaria, and all these types of agents simply makes it impossible to make a vaccine. There are some dreams and publications on so-called general vaccines, cross-protective vaccines, you know, one vaccine that protects against everything. But otherwise, we wouldn't have these changes if that were the case. And the key is... Protection is antigen dependent. So, you know, in normal circumstances, the epidemiologically active infection in the population, in the herd, as we say, keeps the immune response within the herd, within the population actively going and boosts the antibody response up. But if that sort of circulating infection diminishes, and this is one of the dangers of being too efficient with the vaccines, because you basically, you know, diminish the circulating herd immunization by epidemiologically circulating bacterial toxins or viruses. And therefore, we have to revaccinate simply because memory doesn't exist. So, that is probably the most important message today, that we shouldn't forget how this all came about, what the biology behind is, because now we don't only have to convince the parents to have their kids vaccinated, we even must go further and have the parents, particularly the mothers, revaccinated periodically to sort of keep this protective mechanism up, otherwise we have probably disease problems. Now, of course, you can speculate and, again, be clever, and instead of showing the surface of a virus or a bacterium like this, you simply draw one of these structures. And now you say, well, you know, this is not true that you need protective antibodies against the head of this thing. You can make protect antibodies against the, the part that is hidden, so to say, in this, in this envelope. 
So one makes vaccines with this constant part, but as I've told you, these antibodies cannot reach in between these variable or these serologically defined uh, head determinants that are, and therefore these, this is simply wishful thinking and will not come to fruition. But there are theoretical types of vaccines one can think of. Let's take influenza. You know there are many H1, H2, H3, H7, H whatever, uh, with all sorts of combinations and, and some variations of H1. There is H1 dash, H1 two dash and so on. So maybe there are a hundred or a thousand variants of influenza. You will not have an antibody that covers everybody. But you can make a vaccine by simply putting together 500 or a thousand influenza viruses. Because that would comprise the whole repertoire of all the various viruses. Or for HIV, you could do something similar. The problem with HIV is probably not a a hundred to a thousand is probably a hundred thousand to a million variants. Now, you know, things become a bit more demanding. And the other point is that so far we haven't had these types of combinatorial type of multi, you know, factor types of vaccines. So the whole regulatory process, how to, to make such vaccines safe and get them through the, you know, the drug administration type of control mechanism. You know, this is, is up for grabs, but at least this, this would be doable. So, new vaccines, there's a lot of hope. Maybe there isn't too much hype. They will not be available. There will be no vaccine against HIV. There will be no general, general vaccine against influenza. We will have to do it, at least for the moment, the old way. And any new development will have to be based on this antibody specificity of, of uh, the so-called serotypic definition. And to think of, um, of vaccines against solid tumours um, basically has the same problem. Because it's very difficult to kick off the immune response to such high efficacy levels that would get rid of the tumour. So yes, hope is not impossible, but for the moment I think largely it's unlikely that we can solve these problems and therefore of course for example in HIV or similar problems it's much more important to do prevention and be reasonable because HIV, you know, one doesn't have to catch HIV. One catches it if one is a drug addict or practices unsafe sex. And this, of course, has only to do with behaviour. But that's, of course, the most, even more complicated than developing a new vaccine. And that's why science and politics go for the vaccine, even if it's impossible. Thanks very much. <laughs>
But that doesn't kill the species, you see. And that's, in the end, that's biology. Because any condition, any situation where everybody dies is, of course, no solution. And that's why all these infectious agents don't kill us to 100%. And if only 10% survive, and smallpox is a good example of that, you know, we do basically fine. It's not very acceptable today, you know, but... <laughs> Well, that's a very optimistic and, I think, um, generous interpretation of the situation. <laughs> because, um, of course, you know, the percentage I take, you know, the Swiss situation, where it has been known for a long time, if measles coverage by vaccines drops below 82%, measles is back. But it's not, it's back clinically. But the virus is around all the time, simply because 82% are vaccinated. The level and the, let's say, the intensity of infection is just below clinical requirement. So, in fact, at the moment, those parents who do not vaccinate their kids actually profit from the vaccinees. So they are, let's call it, not very altruistic. <laughs> it's, it seems reasonably well uh, known that people who are isolated for an extended period, uh, people that went to Antarctica for over winter or longer periods, um, stayed healthy while they were there, uh, but they frequently got something when they came back. Is that because their immunology memory system simply runs down and there's not enough of it left? Or does the bug change while they're away, or is it both? No, the latter is usually not the case. But, you know, the re-exposure is the problem. So if you are in an isolated place, I mean, there are classical examples, for example, um, you know, um, expats going to Africa, actually sort of halfway living with malaria, go back to London, for example, and are not re-exposed, of course, to malaria parasites. So a year, year later, they go back to, to the same spot they have been before, and they immediately basically get sick with malaria again. But while they were there, you know, this sort of equivalent, equilibrium was held up. And there are many examples of this time. Cholera, for example, is, you know, in Bangladesh itself, the Bangladeshi, within these rather humid environments and inundation, they are basically constantly exposed to low doses of cholera, Libra cholera. If they go to London, and a year later go back to Bangladesh, they immediately get sick. Thanks.